Hey, what's going on, Kamigu family? Hope you're doing well. Uh, as always, it's so good to be together. Hey, if you are new to this experience, new to this community, my name is Royce, one of the pastors here, and uh, just so honored that you choose to spend your Sunday morning with us. We are a Jesus community that believes the church exists for the common good and for the benefit and the flourishing of all people and all persons, no matter their race, their ethnicity, their age, their gender identity, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability, socioeconomic status, even spiritual background. And so, hey, we just want you to know that whatever your story, whatever your background, uh, wherever you might be on your spiritual journey, uh, you're welcome here. We love you, and we hope that you may be blessed and encouraged today. Um, and by the way, if there's anything that we can do to serve you uh, and get you connected to the life of this community, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can fill out our digital connect card at commongood.church slash connect. Well, I want to jump right in this morning. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 14. And uh, we have been now in a story for the past several weeks that I want to re reread for us. Uh, this morning. It says this in verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they're terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I want to continue today in a collection of talks that we have now been in for the past several weeks uh, that we've entitled Faith for the Middle. We're in the home stretch. We've got today, and then we've got next Sunday, and then we're done. Uh, but one of the things that we've been acknowledging in this season as a community uh, is that if we're honest with ourselves, the reality is much of life can often feel like we're living somewhere in the middle, right? We're not where we used to be, but we're certainly not yet where we want to be or thought we would be or, or hoped we would be. And the truth is experiencing life in the middle, it can be hard and difficult and frustrating and demoralizing and exhausting so much so that perhaps you have even considered thrown in the towel given up and quitting altogether. Well, I think such was the case for the 12 disciples when we get to our story in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus just finishes performing this incredible miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 with just two fish and five loaves of bread. And as Jesus is wrapping up the miracle, uh, dismissing the crowds, uh, the scriptures tell us that he sends the disciples on ahead of him uh, in a boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And while the disciples are a considerable distance from the land where they were just, the shore that they were just at, and route to the other side, they encounter a, a massive storm. And as a result, what should have really only taken one to two hours to cross over to the other side has now taken them six, seven, eight, nine hours, and they're still not yet on the other side. They're, they're stuck right there in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the sea. But here's what I love about the story, is that right when they're about to quit and throw in the towel, Jesus shows up in the middle. Jesus shows up in the middle of their storm, in the middle of the sea, and because Jesus shows up, Peter experiences a miracle right there in the middle of the storm, right there in the middle of the sea. Peter, the scriptures tell us, he gets up out of a boat and he starts walking on water. Peter has this walk on water moment right there in the middle, and he's never the same again, right? And what we discover is that from the story is that, that all it took for Peter to experience this life-changing, life-altering miracle right there in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea, was a little bit of faith. Not a lot of faith, just a little bit. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves is how can we have faith like Peter for the middle? Not a lot of faith, but just a little bit of faith so that we too can experience a walk on water moment, so that we can experience some miracles even in the middle. So this is the journey that we've been on. This is the conversation we've been having as a church over the past several weeks. We're just sitting in the story. We're just rereading the story and inviting God's Spirit to speak to us and, and helping us to perhaps extract uh, different concepts and principles and truths that could help you and I, as we find ourselves in the middle, to learn to have some faith, even for the middle, so that we too can experience some 
walk on water moments with Jesus. So today what I want to do is I want to hone in on verse 30 through 31. And I want to preach to you um, really from a simple premise. It's the title of my talk. You can write this down if you're taking notes at home. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Um, are, are you a perfectionist? Do you know any perfectionists? Uh, the type of person that has really, really high standards and expectations for themselves and the type of person that is constantly and regularly overly critical of, of themselves. My 11-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, um, she's a, a perfectionist through and through, especially when it comes to her art. She's, a, she's an artist at heart, super creative, has an eye for design. She loves draw, drawing, making art, crafts. Um, she creates some of the most amazing creative cards. Uh, in fact, she's like now our family's official card maker. <laughs> we don't go to Rite Aid or Walgreens anymore to buy cards. We just go to McKenzie and we're like, McKenzie, how much do we have to pay you? Make us a birthday card. And um, <clears throat> we're trying to, by the way, get her to start her own card making business. Hopefully that'll happen one of these days. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is they, they get these phenomenal, beautiful cards. Uh, but what they don't realize is that the final product that they're seeing oftentimes is the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth iteration of something that she's been working on in her room for hours. Because why? Because she's a perfectionist. Now, I've known for a while that she's had some perfectionist tendencies, but I don't think I fully realized how much of a perfectionist she is until one day I came into her room after she had been working on making a card, and the room was full of like crumpled up pieces of paper, literally just like all over, and I'm like, Maggie, like, what's all this? And she was like, my mistakes. Come on, how do you know that that's a sign of a perfectionist? She hates making mistakes, so much so that she makes a mistake, she just crumps up the paper and throws it away and starts all over, right? It's not perfect, it's not good enough, it's not gonna work. Let's start over. One time, um, she, she made a birthday card for her uncle Austin, my bro, and uh, she asked me how old Austin was turning, I thought he was turning a certain age, so I told her the age. She creates this amazing card, uh, and then as she's leaving for school, um, my bro's coming over to the house, and, he, and I was supposed to give it to him for her, and it's like five minutes before she had to go to school. Uh, I realized that I actually told her the wrong age, and she was like so upset. She literally started, like, don't tell Mackie that I told you this. She literally started tearing up, and she was literally ready to like crumple the whole card up. She was already done, and I'm like, no, don't do it. And I was like, let me, let, let's compromise. Let me fix it for you. I promise I'll fix it while you're at school. And she's like, okay. She's like, you better make it good. And she's like, take a picture of it and text it to me before so that she could approve it before, she, before, she, before I gave it to Austin. Uh, that's just how much of a perfectionist she is. Now, I say all that to say, whether or not you're like my daughter, Mackenzie, whether or not you consider yourself a perfectionist, um, I want to propose to you this morning that I think the reality is, is that perfectionism and this notion of perfectionism, uh, whether or not you may identify yourself as a perfectionist, um, I think impacts us actually more than we think. And, and I think that these, these perfectionistic tendencies, namely having very, very high standards for ourselves and being overly critical of ourselves when we can't meet those standards, I think is, is much more common than we think. In fact, some of the data would actually back this up. Uh, there's a recent study that was done about workplace culture in America, and according to the study in their survey, they found that 92% of the people surveyed admitted that they are affected in some way, shape, or form by perfectionism. And, and as it turns out, another study has, has shown that perfectionism is actually becoming increasingly more and more common amongst especially young people. Uh, a recent study that was done a few years back published by the American Psycho uh, Psychological Association, um, they, they did a, a, a survey and it was called the multidimensional scale. It was like this test. And what they're trying to test for is uh, generational changes in perfectionism from the late 1980s to the 2016s. And they measured three types of perfectionism, uh, self-oriented or uh, an irrational desire to be perfect. Uh, then they also measured this notion of a socially prescribed or uh, perceived excessive expectations from others. And then the third was the other oriented, the, the placing unrealistic standards or expectations on, uh, on others. And uh, the study uh, that was published in the journal Psychological uh, Bulletin 
found that more uh, recent generations of college students reported significantly higher scores for each form of perfectionism than earlier generations. Specifically between 1989 and 2016, uh, the self-oriented perfectionism score increased by 10%, uh, socially prescribed increased by 33%, and other oriented increased by 16%. Uh, so the point being is that uh, studies are showing that there has been an increase, especially amongst young people, in the ways in which they are experiencing this notion or this idea of perfe perfectionism. Right? And then if you think about it, uh, you, you layer on intersections of race and ethnicity and gender, and, and I think perfectionism becomes even more commonplace, especially when we think about minoritized groups or communities. Right? If you start to think about some of the racial, family, cultural dynamics that are at play that are oftentimes at the root of perfectionism. For example, uh, for those of us who identify as Asian, Asian American, right? In a lot of ways for, for those of us uh, who identify, um, perfectionism is, is, is very much ingrained in our cultural upbringing, right? Because we come from, many of us, we come from a lineage of, of immigrant parents and uh, grandparents and great grandparents who sacrificed everything to come to America to provide a better life for their kids and their grandkids. And so for those of us who come from such families, right, uh, it, it's no wonder that perfectionism starts to breed because it comes from this desire to, to, to please our parents, right? And to seek our parents' approval and to make our parents proud. And, and oftentimes, right, as kids, we experience this, right, that no matter how hard we tried, no matter how good we did, how what kind of grades we got, for whatever reason, it just never felt like it was good enough, right? And, and so many of us, we grew up with this sense of like, no matter how hard I try, it's, it's still not going to please our parents. It's still not going to make them happy. And I think all these things continue to lead to um, a desire right, to, to be perfectionist. And so many of us, we feel this high pressure that's placed on us to perform, to be perfect, and to succeed, if not for ourselves, certainly for our parents and for our ancestors. And then, and then on top of that, if we think about uh, 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 communities of color, people of color, uh, minoritized groups, right, not only are there familiar pressures, oftentimes that we face in our homes, but, but many minoritized groups feel this pressure to be perfect just to make it or to survive or to succeed in these larger systems or structures or institutions in this country, right? Because we recognize that most of the systems and institutions in this country were never built or intended for minorities to, to succeed in the first place, right? And so it leads to this extra pressure and expectation um, for minoritized groups to feel like they need to be perfect, right? If we're going to really make it. Um, whether it's in school, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in politics, right? It's like there's this expectation that you, you've got to be so good, you've got to be so perfect so that you can outperform everyone else just so you prove to everybody that you actually deserve to have a seat at the table, right? So oftentimes for, for minoritized groups, it's this idea that, that we've got to prove ourselves in, in a white man's world. Um, and we've got to prove that we're worthy. We've got to prove that we actually belong. And so here's my point, church. My point is that I think, I think perfectionism actually impacts more of us more than we think, whether consciously or subconsciously. And, and here's the thing about perfectionism, right, is that while perfectionism is often seen as a positive attribute in society, that, that uh, uh, certainly a society that celebrates and demands excellence and exceptionalism, right? Perfectionists are seen as high achievers. They're smart. They're talented. Uh, they're the hard worker. They're never settling. They're always striving and wanting the best. Here's the problem, though, with perfectionism is that perfectionism has a dark side. Perfectionism has a downside. Perfectionism actually has some negative effects. See, while from the outside, from, from the outside looking in, perfectionism is, is esteemed. It's admire, people are impressed, but on the inside, right, perfectionism can actually be extremely detrimental to our overall mental health and physical well-being and happiness and joy, right? Perfectionism actually eats away at us on the inside, and studies have revealed that perfectionism has become, uh, can become debilitating and paralyzing and anxiety-producing, and it can cause depression, and it causes many of us to feel uh, inadequate and insecure, Right, never feeling like we're good enough. And studies have shown that it's even led to, to suicidal thoughts or behaviors. The same study that I quoted earlier 
um, <clears throat> from the um, psychologic, uh, American Psychological Association. Uh, they said this in, in, in this article. Um, and let me just read it, read this quote for us. It says, the drive to be perfect in, my, in body, mind, and career among today's college students, listen to this, has significantly increased uh, compared with prior generations, which may be taking a toll on young people's mental health, according to research published by the American Psychological Association. Meritocracy places a strong need for young people to strive, perform, and achieve in modern life. Young people are responding by reporting increasingly unrealistic educational and professional expectations for themselves. As a result, perfectionism is rising among millennials. Today's young people are competing with each other in order to meet societal pressures to succeed, and they feel that perfectionism is necessary in order to feel safe, socially connected, and of worth. The increase in perfectionism may in part be affecting the psychological health of students, citing higher levels of depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts than a decade ago. And, and so, church, here's the reality I think that, that we're facing. I think many of us, uh, we struggle with perfectionism to one extent or another, in some shape or form or another, whether or not we realize it or not, right? Whether it's our own desire to be perfect, um, whether it's our perceived perception or reality that perfectionism is expected from us by our parents, by our families, by our bosses and our managers, or, or perhaps it's the unhealthy and unrealistic expectation of perfectionism that we actually put on others. Uh, here's the thing, whether we identify as perfectionists or not, I think, to, I think to a certain extent we all struggle, right, with holding ourselves to these high standards and high expectations and being overly critical of ourselves when we make mistakes and fall short. Uh, they just show up in different ways, in different areas, whether it's in school and grades, work, job, or career, or maybe it's in the home, it's with our marriages or raising kids. And, and, and the problem and the damaging truth about perfectionism, however we experience it, is that, it, it, is that whether it's our own expectations or feeling the pressure of others' expectations that are put on us, what happens is that many of us live under this constant pressure and this burden um, to do better and to be better. And it, it can be paralyzing. And it can lead to stress and anxiety and depression and feelings of inadequacy and never being good enough. And then here's the thing. Here's the thing. Perfectionism then, here's what happens when it comes to this topic and this notion of, of being in the middle. Perfectionism makes living and being in the middle extremely difficult. Right? Think about it, because at the end of the day, when we find ourselves stuck in the middle, when we find ourselves not where we used to be, but certainly not where we want to be or hoped we would be or thought we would be, when we're not making progress, here's what happens. The middle reminds us and it tells us that we're not perfect. Right? The middle reminds us on a constant daily basis that we have actually yet to live up to our standards and our expectations of ourselves of where we want to be or thought we would be or should be. Right, because if we were perfect, here's the thing, we wouldn't be stuck in the middle, right? If we were perfect, we would have already arrived by now. And so here's the thing, perfectionism, then it causes many of us to, to feel, as we, feel like as we find ourselves in the middle that we somehow fail, that something is wrong with us. Because why? Because we're not actually living up to our own expectations and standards or the expectations and standards that others have put on us. And so church, here's what happens. I think that it's extremely hard to have faith for the middle when we struggle with perfectionism, when we desire or think we need to be perfect, or when we feel the pressure from others to live up to a certain expectation. Because our, our middle is a constant reminder that we're not living up to the expectations and the standards that we set for ourselves or that others have set for us. And as a result, many of us feel stressed, we feel anxious, we're depressed, we're disappointed in ourselves, we're angry with ourselves, we think that we're failures and that something's wrong with us and that we're not good enough and we just can't measure up. But church, Here's what I came to remind you of this morning. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. And while society and family and cultural dynamics seem to expect us to be perfect, can I suggest this morning that God doesn't? Come on, in fact, let me let you in on a little secret. If you want to have some faith for the middle, I think we've actually got to learn to start learning to be okay with not being perfect. If we want to have some faith for the middle, we need to come to terms with the fact that it's okay not to be perfect and you don't need 
to be perfect. Uh, and in fact, I think this is exactly what I think our text reminds us of this morning. Like what I find so encouraging about a story this morning is, is if we look at Peter, I think what we find and discover in Peter is that it's a reminder that when it comes to this journey called life and life lived in the middle, it's not about perfection. And that when it comes to having faith for the middle, faith doesn't have to be perfect. But what I love about the story this morning is that if you think about it, what allowed Peter to have some faith for the middle that allowed him to walk on some water, right? Is that what we discover is that Peter's journey in the middle was actually far from perfect. And Peter's faith in the middle was far from perfect. I mean, think about it. Peter has this incredible moment where he gets out of the boat and walks on water. He's experiencing this miracle. And uh, he's having this life-altering moment right there in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea. Jesus and Je- Jesus is literally, Peter's literally walking on the water towards Jesus. And you would think like, this is picture perfect faith, right? I, I don't know how many sermons I heard growing up as a kid in church. And they would always preach that this is a perfect example of what it looks like to, to have faith. We got to have faith like Peter, right? This is the perfect example of faith. And can I suggest this is a perfect example of what faith can look like. But can I suggest it's not a perfect faith by any means. Uh, And just look what happens in verse 30, right? Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on water towards Jesus. And all of a sudden, what do we discover, right? We don't know how many steps Peter takes, but the scriptures tell us in verse 30 that at some point, who knows, maybe even just a few steps, what happens? It says in verse 30, Peter sees the wind. In other words, can I suggest Peter gets distracted? Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. Peter starts comparing himself to his surroundings. Peter lets the circumstances around him start to influence his faith. Church, can I suggest that's not perfection. Perfection is not to get distracted. Perfection is staying laser focused. Perfection is always keeping your eyes on Jesus. Perfection is not comparing yourself to your surroundings and not being influenced by your outward circumstances. But yet, what do we discover? Peter does all of the above. Peter gets distracted. Peter compares himself to the surround, his surroundings. Peter is being influenced by his circumstances. Not only does that happen, right? But what does it say next? When, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, right? Because he sees the wind, he becomes afraid. Can I suggest that's not perfection? Perfection, especially when it comes to this notion of perfect faith, is what? Is to not be afraid, right? Perfect faith says that we shouldn't be afraid. We, we shouldn't fear because God is with us and God is for us. And if God is for us, then who can be against us, right? Perfect faith says, faith says that there's no room for fear and that there's no room to be afraid. But what do we discover? That what? Peter becomes afraid. Come on, Peter is far from per- perfect. His faith is far from perfect. Not only does he become afraid, but then what happens? Because he becomes afraid, what happens? He begins to sink. Peter starts to sink. Church, can I just suggest Sinking is not perfection. Perfection doesn't sink. Perfection doesn't stumble. Perfection doesn't falter. Perfection doesn't fall. Perfection doesn't make mistakes. But what do we see Peter doing? Peter starts to sink. And then what does it say? Then he cries out. And he says, Lord, save me. Peter cries out for help. Can I suggest perfection doesn't cry out for help? Perfect people don't need help. Perfection says, I don't need help. Perfection says, I'm self-sufficient. Perfection says, I'm all good by myself. I can do this thing on my own. I don't need help. But what do we discover? Peter cries out for help. Peter says, Lord, save me. Church, what's my point? What am I trying to get at? This is what I want us to see. That what Peter is doing as he's having this walk on water moment with Jesus in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea, is not perfection. This is not a picture of perfection. Peter's journey in the middle is far from perfect. And here's the thing. I think Jesus is okay with it. I think Jesus is okay with Peter not being perfect. Look what happens next in verse 31. What does it say? It says, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Immediately. At once. Without hesitation. Without waiting. Without delay. Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. I think the fact that Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and catches Peter communicates something important about how Jesus feels about Peter's performance in this moment. See, I think Jesus' immediacy in reaching out his hand to catch Peter as he started sinking is to suggest that I think Jesus actually knew that Peter, at some point, would start sinking. 
It's almost as if Jesus was expecting it to happen, as if Jesus knew that Peter would at some point start to think. I think Jesus knew that Peter would sink, right? You know, when I was teaching my kids how to ride a bike, um, I knew that as soon as I let them go, there's a good chance that they might fall, right? And so what did I do as a parent? As I'm letting my kid go, here's what I do. I would run alongside of him and I would have my hands ready to catch him. I'm prepared, why? Because I just knew that as they're learning, there's a high likelihood that they're probably gonna fall. I think Jesus had a pretty good feeling at some point that Peter would get distracted and start to sink in. So that's why, what do we see happen? Immediately, Jesus is able to reach out his hand and catch Peter. See, here's the thing. We might expect perfection, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus wasn't expecting Peter, perfection from Peter. And I think Jesus was fine with it. I think if Jesus, think about it, if Jesus wasn't fine with Peter not being perfect, I think perhaps Jesus wouldn't have saved him immediately, right? Perhaps Jesus wouldn't have reached out his hand immediately. Jesus reaching out his hand is to suggest that not only did Jesus expect Peter not to be perfect, but that Jesus is fine with it. And he wants Peter to know that in immediately reaching out his hand to help him, that he's actually affirming that it's okay for Peter not to be perfect because Jesus is always right there to catch him. Which brings me then to, to, to this other observation uh, uh, that, that I think communicates Jesus being okay with Peter not being perfect. See, I think it's important to note that how Jesus saves Peter from sinking is important because scripture says that Jesus catches him, right? Like, think about it. If Jesus wasn't okay with not being perfect, you know what I think Jesus would do? Just pick him up and carry him right? If the goal was perfection, then I think what Jesus would have done in that moment is just picked Peter up, plucked him on the boat, and put him back on the boat, if that's the goal. Jesus doesn't pick him up and carry him. No, Jesus catches him. Jesus pulls him back up and puts him back on his two feet so that he can walk on water again, as if to say, I'm not looking for perfection. I'm not looking for you not to fall and not to stumble and not to sink. I'm actually okay with it. You don't have to be perfect. That's why I caught you and I put you back on your two feet so that you can dust yourself stuff off and try again, right? So church, here's my point. I think Jesus was okay with Peter not being perfect and not having a perfect faith. And Jesus can I suggest, is okay with you not being perfect either. Church, here's what I want to know. You want to know how to have faith for the middle? Stop trying to be perfect. Stop trying to be so concerned and obsessed with perfection. You got to realize it's not about perfection and that while society and culture may have placed these expectations on yourself to be perfect or that you have placed these expectations on yourself, God doesn't. Jesus doesn't. Jesus knows you're not going to walk this journey called life perfectly and Jesus is okay with it. And here's the good news, is that Jesus is there to catch you when you trip and when you stumble and when you fall. And Jesus is there to put you back on your two feet so that you can try again. Church, you don't have to be perfect. Stop trying to be perfect. Because as long as you continue to try to be perfect and think you need to be perfect, the middle is gonna be really, really hard. The middle is gonna feel agonizing. The middle will be frustrating. The middle will feel depressing. The middle will feel like you're a failure and that something is wrong with you and that you're not good enough. Can I just encourage you? Free yourself from the burden and the pressure and the expectation of feeling like you've got to do this thing perfectly. Jesus doesn't expect perfection from you. Can I suggest? Neither should you. You don't have to be perfect, so stop trying to be perfect. So how do we do it? How do we do it practically? I know it's one thing just to say, hey, we got to just stop being perfectionists. We got to change our minds that we should be okay with not being perfect. How do we do that? Can I just, as we conclude, just really, 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 really quickly, just offer a few practical solutions from our story this morning, solutions, suggestions from our story this morning as we conclude. I think here's one thing that we could do. If we want to move away from overcoming our perfectionism to actually be okay with being not perfect uh, so that we could actually have some faith in the middle. Here's one thing. Try to understand the root of your perfectionism and where it comes from. Being able to overcome your perfectionism requires that you know where it comes from, right? What is the source of your perfectionism? Is it it partly because of just how you're wired, is how God made you, or is part of it because of the pressures in society and the culture that we bought into and how it defines success and, and, and the cost to get there? Is it because of expectations that 
others have put on you, your family, your spouse, your parents, your boss, your kids, um, is, is the root of it because you want to prove your worth, you want to prove that you're a validation, that you want to get the approval of others, right? So I would do this, take some time to get to the bottom of where your perfectionism is coming from and explore the roots of your perfectionism if you're going to find a way to overcome your perfectionism, right? So that's the first thing. Number two is this, I think learn to take more risks. Take risks. That's one of the best things that we could do to overcome perfectionism and to actually just be okay with not being perfect. Step out of the boat like Peter more often, right? Peter wasn't sure that he could really do it. Can I suggest you don't always have to be sure and certain to step out of the boat and to start walking on some water. Peter wasn't sure, but he stepped out anyways. And I think one of the best ways that we can get out of this perfectionist mindset is to take more risk. Um, here's another thing you could do. Give yourself, and this is really important, give yourself a lot of grace and more grace and lots and lots of grace. Here's the thing, when you take risks, you're gonna make mistakes. So give yourself grace. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. Give yourself permission to not have all the answers. Give yourself permission to not always get it right the first time. Uh, give yourself permission to mess up and to make mistakes and give yourself permission to, to, to try things and to fail and I don't know, to get distracted sometimes, to just like Peter, to give yourself permission to be afraid. Give yourself permission to, just like Peter, sink and stumble and fall down sometimes, right? I think we gotta stop beating ourselves up because Jesus is not doing it, right? Just remember we're human and we're far from perfect. Jesus doesn't expect perfectionism. I think if Jesus doesn't shame us for not being perfect and, and not having perfect faith, then why do we shame ourselves, right? Why do we put this undue pressure and expectation on ourselves when God doesn't? It'll only lead to discouragement and feeling like you're a failure and feeling like you're not good enough. And it'll lead to stress and anxiety and depression. All right, here's another thing you can do. Um, ask Jesus for help often. One of the best ways to, uh, to counter the spirit of perfectionism is to just acknowledge that you can't do this thing called life on your own, nor do you have to do this thing on your own. Right? I love what Peter does. Peter stumbles, falls, sinks, and he cries out and he asks Jesus for help. He asks Jesus to save, save him. Can I suggest, let's do that on a regular basis. Cry out to Jesus on a regular basis because asking Jesus for help reminds us that you can't do it on your own. And as much as you wanna be perfect, you can't. And you know what? That's okay. Um, here's another thing that I think could help. Learn to trust that Jesus will always be there to catch you when you fall. This is huge. The more that we could trust that Jesus is there for you to catch you when you stumble and when you fall and when you feel like you're sinking, the, the, the more that, and the more that we can understand that Jesus is there to make up the gap that we can't do on our own, then, then for us it starts to alleviate the pressure for you and I to actually feel like we have to be perfect and that we have to do it all. Some of that begins to decrease. Because here's the truth. Come on, even though when we struggle with faith, even when our faith is little, even when our faith falls short, can I suggest Jesus is always faithful to us and we can rely on Jesus to be faithful. And so if you, if you wanna learn to overcome your spirit of perfectionism, then, then, then learn to trust that Jesus is always gonna be there, even when you stumble. Uh, here's another thing I would encourage you to do. Celebrate the little wins. Celebrate the little wins. I love what Jesus says after he reaches out his hand and catches Peter. What does Jesus say? He says, Peter, you have little faith. Why, why did you doubt? Now I think so many of us, we read verse 31 as like Jesus reprimanding Peter. Almost as if like Jesus is scolding Peter, like Jesus is shaming Peter, like Jesus is mad at Peter. And I wonder some of why we interpret it like that is because we're simply imposing how our parents or how our bosses treated us when we faltered and when we stumbled and we didn't live up to expectations, right? Which by the way, uh, Bible reading tip, this is why we need to recognize that whenever we read and interpret scripture, we're always reading from a particular lens, right? There's no such thing as an objective reading of scripture. We're gonna interpret scripture based on our experiences and our upbringing. upbringing. And if our experiencing and upbringing is that we had parents that never approved of us, if we had parents that were always disappointed with us and they always communicated their disappointment with us every single time we messed up and didn't live up to expectations and we were punished by it, right? Then, then it's no wonder that when we read scripture, that's how we think that Jesus is probably interacting with Peter. But can I suggest that perhaps that's not the tone of Jesus? Perhaps the tone of Jesus and what Jesus is doing in this moment as he sees Peter sinking and as he saves him, Peter, Jesus says to Peter, hey, I want you to know, having some little faith, having a little doubt, that's not perfect. But but that's why I'm here. And because you had just a little bit of faith, you were able to walk on water. Oh, you didn't have a lot of faith and your faith was far from perfect. But Peter, 
Your little imperfect faith, I need you to know this, Peter, allowed you to walk on some water. You don't need to have perfect faith. You just need to have a little bit of faith. I think Jesus wants to wants Peter to acknowledge in that moment that even his little bit of faith is something to be celebrated. It's something to be acknowledged. Church, can I just encourage you? You want to know how to overcome a spirit of, of perfectionism? Learn just to celebrate the little wins. Right? We're oftentimes so focused on all the negativity and all the bad and all the things that aren't working. But let's learn to acknowledge the, the wins. Let's acknowledge the things that are, do, that are working and, that, uh, and, and those moments and times where we have a little bit, bit of faith and where we can actually see miracles and we can experience God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Uh, and then the last thing is this. Here, here's something really important. Um, if you want to overcome a, a spirit of, of, of perfectionism, is, is learn to get back on your feet and to start walking again. Learn to get back on your feet and start walking. In other words, keep walking. Don't stop walking. The best way to overcome a spirit of perfectionism is to keep going, is to keep trying, is to keep moving. Don't stop. Don't let perfectionism paralyze you. Keep, keep taking steps, small steps of faith, little bit, of, little bitty steps of faith. Right? Peter didn't need a lot of faith to walk on water. He just needed a little bit of faith. So learn, you and I, to take. we can learn to, to take some little steps of faith, take some baby steps, just one foot in front of the other. Just keep walking. Don't quit. Don't give up. And don't stop. Come on, that's kind of how we're going to be able to overcome the spirit of perfectionism. Don't quit. Don't stop. Get back up. You might fall. You might stumble. But Jesus is there to pick you up. And as soon as you get back up, we can keep moving and we can keep going. All right, let me just pray for us. Uh, God, we thank you so much for uh, just the reminder this morning. So many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we struggle with perfectionism. And uh, we perhaps may not self-identify as perfectionists, but we all have tendencies where we put these um, pressures and these expectations that are often so unrealistic and so unattainable. And that's why many of us perhaps feel like we're in the middle because we have set expectations, we have set destinations, and we have said that we should be in certain places and have certain things, but for whatever reason, we're not there yet. And so we find ourselves uh, stuck in the middle and it's, it's discouraging and it's frustrating. And especially for those of us, because we have these high expectations and we tend to be critical of ourselves, that being in the middle is, is hard because it reminds us of how far from perfect we are. And for all, so much of our lives, we have been taught, we have been conditioned to believe that we need to be perfect, that we need to, um, to, that we need to have all the answers, that we need to, to do it exactly a certain way. Um, but God, we thank you for the reminder this morning through the story of Peter. That Peter's journey in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea, was far from perfect. And Peter's faith, the little bit of faith that he had that allowed him to have this walk on water moment with you, was far from perfect. But yet, but yet, you used that little bit of faith that enabled him and gave him the opportunity to experience something that he never got to experience again. And so God, I pray that you would help us, you would encourage us, you would remind us that if we want to have faith like Peter for the middle, would you remind us? Would you set us free from the pressure and the burden of living under an expectation that we need to be perfect? God, we thank you for the reminder that it's okay not to be perfect, that we don't have to be perfect, that that's not what you expect from us. And so help us, God, to be released and freed from this undue pressure of trying to be perfect, that we will learn to embrace the fact that we are far from perfect and that we could extend grace to ourselves so that we might keep walking, so that we might keep following after you step by step and to continue to experience the things that you would have for us even in the middle. We thank you, we love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message. I hope it was encouraging. Um, we're going to be putting some questions up on the screen for you to reflect around either on your own or perhaps with friends or family or coworkers, coworkers, your co-op, or even your house church. Uh, of course, if there's anything that's your heart, a question, um, something that maybe you're needing prayer for, wanting prayer for, uh, you just want somebody to talk to, you can send us a message at commongood.church slash prayer. And uh, myself or one of the other pastors would love to connect with you. Okay. Hey, God bless. Have an incredible week. Um, hey, we'll see you next Sunday. Final installment conclusion to this collection of talks. We'll talk to you soon.